projector. Better quality projector. That's good. Andreas, I need to leave around 10.30. Okay. That clock is half an hour off, so I won't get it. <laughs> it's in uh, 1900 Mountain Time. Yeah, right. I think it's Special. 1900 clock. So you guys solve the world political crisis, everything else. This is the camera, so. <laughs> if Malcolm and I like inch in your view, just kick us. <laughs> Malcolm, you scoot my way because you'll block the camera. <laughs> okay. okay, got it. So, uh, good morning. Good morning, how are you? I thought this meeting would be a very private meeting to decide how we implement this thing, which is otherwise known as how sausage is made, which is not a very, you know, a very uh, picturesque thing. But uh, uh, the, the gr in terms of opposition to this plan, it's negligible. It's quite negligible. Very few people are actually, if any, <coughs> have actually come out, or at least people that have, have participated, have actually, are, are even skeptical about it. I understand there's a world out there, and by the way, this is unusual to have this much buy-in, frankly. I understand there's a world out there in Facebook that is stirring up skepticism. Mm -hmm. I haven't looked at it. Maybe you can actually show me some of what they're saying, because it's always useful to, to know what people are saying, okay? So the Facebook page. I think what we have against us is the usual, uh, the usual, uh, I don't know how to put it. One of the things that happens when you're an urban planner and a lot of people, you know, this isn't like high art or writing a poem that stays in the drawer and it's as good as the artist can do. The more public you are, the more, uh, the more people have a say, the more the quality drops. There's a kind of, there's a, there's of course excellence and there's terrible stuff. We see it all around us. But there's something that always that always astounds me is that mediocrity is a force like gravity. You know, it's like, what? But we launched this beautiful project and everybody was for it and the vision was crystal clear. And then somehow it goes like this. And it feels like gravity. And so there's a constant there's, it, it needs, uh, excellent needs constant support in, in a public endeavor like urban planning, okay? And so, um, one of the things that I really wanted to talk about today is what could possibly go wrong. Things that can go wrong that make things mediocre. And I'm going to be very frank, and I thought this meeting was actually going to be a private one, with just the mayor, the city council, like how do we, you know, how do we ride this horse that has a tendency to fall? You know, it has a tendency to fall. We do uh, everything in transparent yeah. approach. Now yeah. I heard you do everything <laughs> transparent. So, uh, so uh, there's a whole lot of things that can go wrong. Uh, mostly, I think you can overcome them. One of them is that when, then when there isn't a strong market, the you kind of have to be. You have to be grateful for anything. You know, McDonald's comes in with their lowest quality <coughs> uh, format, and you have to be grateful for McDonald's. You know, and you can't say, "Hey, I want your highest quality format." You take the low quality format. Walmart comes in, which you know is going to destroy your main street, and you say, "We need their tax base." Okay, so there's a lot of that. For various reasons, this place is is a very elite place economically. It has, um, we are told uh, by our studies that it has almost twice the average income of the rest of Colorado. Uh, even even nearby areas next to Denver and, uh, and uh, Boulder, which are pretty high income areas, you have twice the income. Uh, you have an extremely young, youngest by far, uh, uh, elected officials that I've ever seen, you know, and that's the oldest one. Are you one too? I'm, I'm the, the youngest. Is your I'm the eldest member of the board of trustees. That's amazing. I want a picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do, I do we, are, we are very yeah. youthful. Yeah. And of course, the older you get, the more you know things can go wrong. 
You know, we're experts at things. Look, look at my talk today. Like, what's it about? It's things that can go wrong. And so what happens is when you have younger people, is they tend to say yes, they get excited. Older people tend to say no. That is a generalization, but it's really true. Like, if you have a public meeting, actually, here's a technique we've developed. The older people, because generally the world has been getting worse, and it has, there's more traffic, there's less nature, the building, the parking lots are uglier. People have seen, people like a, a, of my age have seen it when it was better, okay? And so their skepticism about any change is really well-founded. Things get worse, I get it. But when you have a public discourse in which only the old people come in, and they, they want to say, no, no, it isn't going to work, we're afraid. We're afraid of that. The young people roll their eyes and leave. Okay? They just do it. I, I, you can actually watch it. You can watch an audience when the first people speak and they say, no, that's not going to work, that's not going to work, that's not going to work. And the old people really roll their eyes and they leave. You can see them leaving. Okay? So one technique I use is I ask the youngest person present to speak first and then the next oldest, and the next oldest, and the next oldest, and the younger they are, the more they say yes. I want to jump off that dock, you know? I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do that. And then what happens is it sets a scene in which the older people are quite embarrassed to say no, because they have seen the, what the young people want. And in our society, we are very respectful of younger people. You know, when they speak, we give them a lot of credence. And so that's one technique you might, you might use. Like in this city, the youngest person present will speak first. And then you will see how many younger people again begin to show up to these meetings. Because, you know, notoriously, the young people don't show up to these meetings. And I think you have to give them a chance to speak first. There's nothing illegal about it. There's nothing odd about it. Just say, who's the youngest person? Hey, hi, I'm 17. Well, I'm 16. Okay, 16 goes first, 17 goes next, 25 goes next. That's a very good technique. The other thing is, um, this is something that hasn't come up at all here, at all. But in most, city, in most cities, there's a real call for diversity. And that's the first thing that comes up. Like, where are the black people? Where are the Hispanic people? Where are the, you know, where's all that? Um, it, it isn't happening here. Oh, I've actually stopped doing that. And what I say, the real diversity is by age. That's the real diversity. You know, and if you can just get, you have to make sure that every age is represented. That's what I go for now. And so your social media actually should be, don't let it be captured by, in the case of, of Florida, condo commandos. You know, you can actually get one homeowners association that's angry, they highly organized, and they can throw an election. You know, and that's not democracy. So. Try to figure out, I'm not an expert in this, how to get representatives by ages. Try to get particularly the 20-year-olds to, uh, to come in. And they will, I think you're absolutely going to find that they're, they're, they're exactly what you need to know and what you want to hear. Um, it took me a long time to realize that, that it's actually the young that are always saying, saying yes. Uh, as far as the developers are concerned, and I say this as a joke, but it's not a joke, you've made it so difficult for them for so long you know, your planning department has actually, people have been trying very hard actually to get permits for a very long time that they're now grateful, they're now willing to say, uh, just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do. You know, like stop torturing me. And we've made quite a lot of uh, uh, progress agreeing on a master plan that this landowner likes, this landowner likes, this landowner loves, okay? Uh, this landowner, we're just beginning to get to know her or them. So we have to, we have to work with them further. But, you know, this for, for, uh, for the, the four principal landowners, if they, and this is a plan that we like, this is a good plan, it's very important that you don't create impediments. The reward system for doing a plan which is better for the city the exchange, what we've exchanged, is what sometimes we call permitting as of right. It's administrative. Once you go through the public process, okay, of getting this approved, then no more public process. As long as they follow the plan, they're permitted as of right. You know, they deal with the planning department, 
They deal with us if you have a problem, but don't throw them to the wolves. If it is going to be just as difficult to do what they normally want as to do what you normally want, and you don't, if you don't relieve the difficulty, what I call the torture, if you don't relieve the torture, there's nothing in it for them. All we've done is made a more difficult plan to implement for them, possibly less profitable in their mind sometimes. This could be less profitable, it's a bigger pain in the ass. And on top of it, they have to have to go through, through torture again. That's not what we're speaking about here. So the, the, the best plans we've done have, have, have been, and by the way, many things here are not controversial. They're just not controversial. You know, there are things that people are happy to do. So the, the proposal that everybody, I think, understands is to very, very quickly pass this plan in principle. Okay? In principle, this is now, is now the uh, accepted master plan for the district plan for this area. And then the planning department takes it apart. It takes this and takes that apart. And then, and then it comes up for examination, public examination, a piece at a time. The reason you do that is that if, for example, there's an angry person here, like these people, oh, you didn't tell us this was happening. Okay, let's just as an example. The most difficult situation holds up everything. So you have to, what you have to do is unpack it into different parcels. And even actually say, you know guys, yeah, these people are, you know, they're kind of, they may be angry, but you can go ahead with that. You see, you've got to unpack it so that which is non-controversial can just go forward. Like for example, this one is not controversial. Why should they be married to somebody that has a problem down here? Because that's the downside of a very big plan is that you've woken up all sorts of dogs all over the place, and that's really unfair to them. Actually, each of these developers working separately would actually do better than all be chained together to the most toxic conditions. So <coughs> this, this is something we've done before, and this is something that I think is crucial. I think if you don't do that, this is going to be held up for a very long time. Another bit of good news is sometimes we have to think about uh, coming recession and that the developers may flip it or not do it. I don't think it's going to happen here because you have such a strong uh, call. First of all, the curious thing is you're not overbuilt. Recessions happen where things are overbuilt. Miami's going to have a recession because it's overbuilt. You know, there, there are other places, but a place like this is not overbuilt. There's going to be a nice strong market, I think, right through whatever recession happens. So I think you can look forward to this happening pretty quickly. Uh, one other thing that came up, there was a call yesterday for very specific, uh, the grocery store you want, the, you know, like you want a Lucky's but not a this, I want a this but not a that, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and they asked me, how do you get that done? And I think it's just a bunch of humans talking together. You know, just, just, there's a human in charge of this site, there's a couple of humans that will come and meet you. They're actually coming at 11 o'clock today. And you've got a few humans here. Just get them together and say, look, could we really have a, you know, we really want, we, we believe that a lucky is exactly the kind of demographic we want, you know? And if somebody wants a cinema, just get the humans together. I think you should have a, some kind of format. And I'm not clear as to what that should be, but a format. In cities, in several cities, there's something called a design center. That's what they call it. There was one in Baton Rouge, there's a famous one, really famous in Memphis. Uh, there's, there's several in Tennessee. And what it is, it's something like a, like a periodic charrette in which you have people that can draw. It's like this week. You have people that can draw, city managers there, you know, to say, hey, I think, I think, I think the, the trustees can go to bat for this. There's uh, uh, Deborah's there reading the code, you know. And a design center is like a, it's like a charrette that you can call for one or two days. That's exactly what it is, actually. And so you come in, the citizens come in, and then you say, well, I want a Lucky's, and I want this, and I want a cinema. And then the developers say, you're not going to get a cinema. You know, sorry, but it ain't going to happen because of Netflix. But, you know, I think we can work with the market you want. I, I don't know any other way to do it, but to have a, a group that is actually instituted 
And if you call it a design center, you will actually participate in a in something that's happening nationally. They're not full-time employees, you know, but you know, somebody with a pencil just like we did this week to do it. The other thing I want to call attention to is I realize that I am by a long shot the toughest guy in this here because and it's because I lead. You see, you know, I'm glad you said it. That had to be said. But you're leaving. I can't do it. I have to live in this town. I would urge you to call me all the time. You know, when there's a tough decision, you can call and say, I'm going to call Andres, see what he says. Then Andres will say no. I said, Andres said no. And I'll continue bearing the brunt of saying no. Because I really don't think anybody in this little town is going to actually has the, has the, is willing to sometimes to say what needs to be said. Okay? So that's something I wanted to call attention to. Just call me about everything. Send me the drawing. You know, I'll sketch over it. I'll give you the reasons why. Most of the time, it's pretty interesting. I'm actually more liberal than the people holding things up. I'm actually just as likely to say, hey, that's good enough. Go with it than to, than to make it harder. But I want, I want real assent, like just call me. You know, this is not even billable hours, just call me. And I'll, I'll, I'll let you know, you know, what I know about it, okay? That is, uh, sometimes people don't do that because they're embarrassed that they're taking my time. They really actually don't. I says, why did you call me? He says, oh, we don't want to take any more of your time. Are you kidding? What I want to see is the project built, the hell with my time. I just want to see it built, so just call me. Get organized, you know. Don't call me six different times. By the way, and don't let the private sector, the other, the, just government calls me, got it? I don't want to hear, I don't want to be lobbied by developers anymore. That's not even actually ethical to have a, a meeting, you know, because I'm working for the city, not the developers, you understand that? You know, so I really shouldn't be able to meet with the developers in, independently. So that's, uh, that's not, uh, don't, don't say, Hey, go visit Andres in Miami and work it out. That doesn't work at all. It just doesn't work. So, you know, have somebody like Deborah or somebody call me, you know. Or city manager, by the way. Okay, here's another thing I've learned. When somebody at the level of, level of Deborah trips up, she risks her job. Okay? When the same decision is made by the city manager, it doesn't risk his job. Because the city manager, yeah. No, you know why? There's a very, a very interesting instance. Like for example, let's say there's a trip and fall issue. You know, a trip and fall. If Deborah says, "Yeah, I'm going to give you a break on that. Yeah, somebody might trip." Okay, so somebody does trip. Deborah says, "Deborah, did you really give him a break on that?" Okay, now the city manager gives the break. Sixteen people trip and fall every month in. You know, in this place. I saw one this morning, actually. And so, that's not his job. So, I think the highest level, if there's anything questionable, it really should be done at the highest. This was taught to me by a city manager, actually. Just send it to me, because I can bear the heat at that level. You see what I'm saying? And it's, uh, it's just the way it works. And I, I, it's very clear to me. Because actually, at the level of, let's say, the regulators and administrators, they really don't really have a right to give you any variances. They can't just say, oh yeah, an eight inch curve is fine. But it's not in the books, the eight inch curve. So, for example, this tunnel we're thinking about, I'm sure the tunnel that goes under, uh, under uh, County Line Road is gonna be full of all sorts of little interpretations that are a problem, right? And somebody has to say, because there's no precedent for it, so somebody has to say, yeah, let's do it this way without actually risking, risking their job. So that's another, that's another thing I've learned. I would like to speak at the highest level, actually, of the, per, you know, when, when there's something controversial, the, the city, is your role actually city manager? Town administrator. Okay, town administrator. Town administrator is about, just about the right level to get the phone call. So that's something I've learned also. What else do I? I have been, uh, one of the things I've, I've spoken about is to write about writing very weak architectural codes, very few rules because, because your architecture is so varied here in Colorado. 
that you don't have a very strong tradition. The more I drive around, I realize you actually do have some tradition. You really do have more tradition than I thought, and I'm gonna sort of write a few more rules, you know, that would make it more harmonious. It's all about harmony. You know, how to get this, you know, how do we get this, this stuff, and this stuff to look like it's in the same universe? You know? When it's done by, <clears throat> by completely different people. Because it's not going to build up right unless unless things are harmonized. So this morning, uh, this morning driving around, I, as I was actually developing an eye for the farmhouses on the way, I was actually realizing that there is actually the DNA here that I'm beginning to notice. You know, and uh, I'll write them up. You'll see it's probably five or six, five or six things about roof pitch, the kind of saturated colors that you use, the very narrow range of colors that you use and so forth. Uh, uh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to contradict something I said earlier, which is that I was going to say we should write a very weak code. I think it should be a little stronger. I think you can create a place. I don't know whether there's anything to do. Um, Andreas? Yeah. I've seen there are a couple of different versions of the plans, uh, and they have what look like some pretty important distinctions. This one has the marketplace to the north, the, another one has it to the south with the entrance from both sides. This one does not have the street connection going from the east to the west in that location. Can you describe, okay, what, um, okay. what, what why the differences and okay. what? Uh, um, the method of, that I use in the charrette is I have very talented people in the team. And I don't need, if I were to make all the decisions, I don't need talented people. I just need draftsmen. So what I do is I run a very, very loose first few days, you know, to let all these very good professionals do their thing. And then towards the end, because I actually become more expert because I have more contact with you, I tighten up a lot. And this morning I'm giving people instructions. You know, I'm just telling them how it is. So there's two phases. There's a, there's a very loose phase, and then there's a tight phase. These plans were actually not, frankly, they're not, they're really not, this plan was done, these two plans were done more, more by me, but all this other stuff was actually done by different people operating professionally, independently. And uh, I think there's some, some uh, to answer your question specifically, I, just, I haven't met these developers yet, and that's the reason we have two. The other one is better. The other one is better. This was actually, frankly, I designed this as a retreat, a retreat position. I often design a retreat position. You know, when you start a battle, you put your regiments in the right place, but it never works out the way you think. So you need to know, well, if this collapses, where do I go? So I wanted to know whether if this moved back here, how bad was it? I just want to know myself, too, how bad it was. I think we can actually get this to work real well. What I would do here is add a few very small single-story buildings to which you could fill, and I've done this before, nothing is new, okay? You can still filter into the market, but you actually uh, mask the parking lot a little better. That would be the retreat position. I think it's acceptable. The other thing, just good news, because of the bridge here, I couldn't think of how we get the, you know, there's a huge ramp to go down to the, uh, tunnel. And I was thinking, well, if the ramp goes here, it cuts off everything. If we turn it north, nobody will ever go up here to get in the ramp to go in. If we turn it south, nobody will go in. And then Chris this morning says, why don't you do a switchback? You know, just a switchback. What the, okay. So basically, we'll pick you up here, go down, over, and like that. So. I was actually I was actually having a hard time this morning saying, damn, I'm gonna have to tell the mayor that ramp is gonna work. <laughs> because you know that was kind of my favorite project to get the, the kids across. But I think we're gonna draw it. You'll see, it'll work. So two comments adding on is will the switchback be open on the top? So really it has go to be. under when you can just see both yes, sides. Th for th that's precisely right. Okay. It'll be mostly open because otherwise you can't bridge across because you hit your forehead. Right. It's only later that you can get under. Okay.
because that way people don't feel trapped coming around that corner. They'll be still visible. There's always, always a a um, security problem in a, in a, in a always in every in, a, in every uh, every under whatever, uh, every tunnel. But I'll say along Spear Boulevard in Denver, which is probably a 10-mile segment, there are at least 20, if not more, examples of exactly this. Underground? They, that the they go back. under Spear. Okay. I see. In and around Cherry Creek. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, yeah. same in Boulder. you got the ones that go to the university yep. across Broadway. Yeah. So that, right. yeah. There's a proven way to do it right, and okay. they have a worse problem than we do. So yeah. Good. We can make it. Uh, and if <coughs> tomorrow you will present what we thought was our best case with the market down. Yeah. Okay, and this is will be given to us in our packet of yeah. drawings. Yeah. Okay. But but by the way, the 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 retreat position ain't bad. Don't lose the market because of that. Right. That's not a retreat position. Okay, one more thing I wanted to add. Um, I I do think that if you in the long run this could be actually one hell of a good town center, and it's going to want to keep growing. And I think we should already design it for parking garages and that kind of thing for, you know, we should be ready for success. By the way, I've already noticed two things. Your two newest buildings, this one, I'm sorry, not this one, the, the rec center is already too small. The police station has hardly been, a, I spoke to one of the policemen <laughs> yesterday, it's already too small, you know? It's already too small, so one of the things that I, I think I should, should bring here is let's really assume success and that you're going to need a parking garage so we're going to place it just to just so that you know that you can actually keep going. By the way, these these guys are not going to object to our doing a plan that allows parking garages later because it just means they're going to do well, right? So yes, that we're going to see. The other thing is uh, there's a, a, a very strong call increasingly for a, for a hotel here. Last night it happened, this morning it happened again. And I don't know whether you have an opinion of where the hotel could be. Right next to the ball fields. Which is where? Here? Here? Because people come from out of state or right. out of town to play right. baseball. You can right. put it on that furthest north portion, right up, that we don't have developers engaged right now on. Up there? Yeah. Um, it could be there. Because then you can walk right across to the ball right. fields. Here. Could also be, could also be here. It, I don't think this is allowed, is it? This because you can only do commercial here. Because the undermining. Because of the undermining. The undermining would be the, the yeah. challenge, yeah. right there. And who who controls that? Is that a, uh, uh, a local law or? A, <laughs> or a, Usually, the state is the one that, that. There's different criteria for residential versus commercial. And we don't want to give waivers for undermining. Yeah, but you know, hotels are quasi. Are quasi commercial. It, uh, hostelry has always been between the two, residential and commercial. Yeah. It's really going to come out of structural engineering. Yeah, state. I think so. So, what I was thinking is that these are the, uh, this is going to be a fun place to, I'm a, I spent a lot of my life in hotels, and there are hotels that are a lot of fun to be in when they're in town centers, and absolute death. So if, I, if I have to do a charrette and I'm in a suburban hotel with nothing to do, no place to eat, it's really a miserable week. And anyone that has a kind of mixed-use town center is really a lot of fun. So I would try, tend to keep them close and close. So I think the site for the hotel should be should be here. somewhere here. Uh, I actually also have another idea. I think there may be there may be a chance for two hotels, just because hotels, not because you have just because hotels really want to be in places like this. They love these places, but they make sure places. It's a great amenity. And actually, the hotels don't have to provide any amenities themselves, not even breakfast, because people can go out to breakfast, and they like that. And somebody had the idea of a pool, like to have a, to have a, a pool that they can use, or a rec center they can use. I mean, it's fantastic. So uh, I might even look at, give you several sites for hotels and see who picks up on it. Andres. Yeah. Knowing what I know about this undermining, where you have your peel-off island, probably just to the west of that? West. Yes, right, on yes. Leslie's property. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because the undermining isn't nearly what it is on our property up there, so that might be yeah. a physically more suitable location to be able to build what 
yeah. the hotel companies like today, which is a three-story right. kind of yeah. garden yeah. hotel. Asking a question on there, but the reason that sounds better to me too is I think we're a little bit further off from developing your parcel than maybe the others. And we have really great crowds in the summer at the ball fields, and then we have all like the weekend holiday visitors to families, but I don't think we have year-round people to support a hotel. What are your thoughts on um, pre town well, center, like what conditions does it take? Okay. Um, it would be a national chain. They have a little six six item checklist that says am I closer to I am am I the closest hotel to the intersection? Because okay. they don't want to be intercepted by another hotel that has better visibility. So if if a hotel uh, operator sees this intersection, which they will, they'll say, I'm too far. Okay. I'll do it if you prevent any of the hotel from being here, because they will have an advantage. You know, they'll do that. So um, that that's for a chain hotel, the guys with the you know with the six with the six item checklist. But there are also people who are operating underneath this. Like for example, there's a I was reminded of the Indian Patel family. Have you heard about them? They'll put a hotel anywhere, precisely because the nationals are too stupid to actually. They're, you know, that six-item checklist really stupefies you. It's not that the, by the way, the humans are never stupid. It's their protocols that are stupid. You know, and so you say, but this is, but this is so great. Well, my protocol doesn't allow me. And they, I've actually been with people who say, I understand exactly what you're saying. Exactly what you're saying, but my, my checklist, my read won't let me do it. So effectively, and so you're getting people that come in and will do things like that, including, by the way, cinemas. Like if you really wanted a fourplex cinema, the big guys won't do it, but there are actually also Indians, immigrants who will do it. And Ketlands has a sixplex cinema that is fantastic, serves martinis, you know? Yes, <laughs> and, they, you know and the big guys with their multiplexes are, are, it's doing real well, in fact, it's expanding. So we can always do that. I keep going back at some point, you know, at some point, you need to talk to certain to humans and not just to people with protocol checklists. So, um, this is very early. By the way, uh, this isn't very creative what we did up here. Partially because I didn't recognize that you were the owner. I just thought you were a person that walked in all the time. <laughs> she is personalized. I walked in. But I didn't know you. I didn't know this was your land, so we never talked. But we can do something more creative. This is just houses, which is you're not gonna. That's a very good market there for the houses. So this could be the very best thing we can do, but we should talk a little further about that. I'm going to also, because the tiny houses idea, I presented them yesterday, and it didn't fly very well. But it didn't fly because tiny houses being houses on wheels, not mobile homes, but little houses on wheels, cute, that actually you can put on places that actually can hold parking lots, because they're actually they're, uh, they're permitted by the Department of Motor Vehicles. So you have a lot of land that maybe, we, because of settlements and undermining, doesn't mean you can't do them. So this morning, I'm gonna, you actually have a factory in Longmont. And I'm gonna go visit them and see what the, what the situation is, how much market they have and so forth. But I run across uh, people who are, in fact, if you go to the internet, they're desperate to find places to set them. And they're actually amazingly expensive. They're not affordable. They're 40, 60, 70, and 80 thousand dollars, but still 80 is less than 300. Than 300, <laughs> so it's relatively affordable. But it's not a for it's not for poor people. That's not. It's people who love them to death. They love them. They polish them. They you know. So I'm going to still make. I'm going to I'm going to speak to the factory <coughs> this morning to see to see whether there's places where they can be. Okay. Uh, uh, that's another thing. Last night, by the way, and also the opposition happened to be primarily from one of the more articulate people. And I'm always aware that, that a person who's articulate can actually dominate the conversation. And that's not really representative of how everybody feels. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep, keep trying. Oh, uh, we were also asked to see what can be done to fix this. And the only thing we could come up with is to really landscape it. You know, to have, to have a coherent planting system that actually always signals you need to signal that you're on this. By the way, this is looking for a name. I don't know what you're going to call it. Loop isn't right, but it needs a nickname, OK? And, and this should have a specific look. 
so that you know that you are, you know, where you are. So are you proposing a, a stoplight then where that road comes out across to the rec center? That would be ideal, yes. On the, on the other right corner? Side. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, no, no. The, uh, to your right, right yes. there? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm proposing a stoplight. And actually here, too. And there is yeah. one there. Yeah. There's there just not one that there. first one. And yeah. If this gets built up, we'll need it. Actually, one of the things that's very unusual is that you own the streets. Usually, we have to deal with Colorado DOT puts everything over for two years. So it's fantastic. You know, it's fantastic. And I think you have a new crew at the Public Works, and they're really, they've been alerted that pedestrians exist, which is astounding. <laughs> you know, they're that generation that went to school when. So you are still proposing a, a street connection from where the community center is across, not just Yes, um, I'm proposing okay. it. You don't have to. I will always propose it. You can make it right in, right out, or not build it. But, but don't block it. Because someday, with, with particularly with, uh, you know, people say, oh, cars are terrible. But cars are getting more and more and more friendly, including the smaller electric ones. You know, for example, if you have... I think we're, I've already seen, have you ever seen a car, a Tesla come pick you up, in which you get out of the car in a restaurant and you tell the Tesla to find a parking space somewhere in a parking garage and they'll find it and then you come out of the restaurant and you call your car back like a dog. It's like absolutely surreal. <laughs> so one of the things is you can actually, I think that cars are actually going to become much friendlier. You know, the electric smaller cars and, you, and they're going to be welcome everywhere. And the speeding SUV thing is actually going to wane. They're already selling much less. I, so we have, to be think, we have to be thinking about the future. We do allow golf carts here, just so you know. You do have golf carts? They're only allowed on 25 mile per hour roads, 35 yeah. mile per hour. So I, some of these connections will enable you can, the yeah. golf carts to get around easier. I would even, if you wanted to, I would say only golf carts can go on those. And by the way, the golf carts are getting better and better and better, too. They're getting, uh, among other things, more dignified. You know, it used to be that only losers would be seen in golf carts, people in Florida that have nothing better to do. But some of the new ones are so well designed. You know, they're really beautiful industrial. What happens around here is people buy surplus golf carts and then they pimp them out. Ah. So they'll take a $1,500 golf cart and then I, I know a few people that will pimp them out and resell them for four, five, six thousand bucks. That's the kind of golf cart they're running around here. So we're already there. Okay. Well, they're winterized. They're just, they're just, Beautiful industrial. Oh, there's another thing too. Like there are eight you know, it, uh, at Panama City Airport, the golf carts um, with eight seats actually can deliver you 10 miles. <laughs> They're really like small electric buses. And uh, because of your snow and the aging population, it's perfect. Like really, just think about it, okay? A circulator, just a cir if this were open and you get a circulator, okay? that comes every 15 minutes, okay, just like that, or even, gee, I wish we could actually connect this. You know what, it'd be really nice if we could get through here to pick up people over here. It just struck me about how limited this is, but this, this is something that would be terrific. Okay, so, so if you have, we could actually calculate, at 15 miles an hour, this might be 15 minutes which means you never wait more than seven minutes. Well, the worst thing you can wait for is five minutes. And it's just absolutely dependable, one employee doing that, and suddenly you don't need a car, right? For older folk, that could be just fantastic. And that's one reason to connect the roads. We spend a lot of time yeah. uh, 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 learning about these, uh, what is happening with the, with the vehicles, and uh, there's two trains of thought. One is that as they become more convenient, they will create even more traffic congestion because they'll be just be moving constantly. And another train of thought says it's the best thing that ever happened to transit. In Columbus, Ohio, they already have a they already have a circulator that doesn't have a driver. It's got a person sitting there like this, but but they're not driving it, and it's just absolutely constant. You just you know it stops for you, it picks you up. Fantastic. So let's assume that that's going to happen here. 
let's assume that there'll be a circulator. So then, yeah. in, in other words, there would be an at grade crossing for vehicles as well, and, yeah. and in addition to the end. Yes, and, and you can actually say only for electrical vehicles. You can actually, you know, uh, as they say, privilege electrical smaller vehicles only, which means that more people would own them. Another thing, actually, is some of you guys that are building garages in Florida now, we build two sizes. There's the, the car and the small electrical vehicle. You know, the garages are beginning to look that way. So there's more storage in the garage. I've also been, I also learned something interesting, which is that the hail, the big balls of hail that destroy your cars, they also destroy your roofs. And so, uh, you may, but there's a kind of, you can, and they destroy shingles, and they destroy solar panels. Solar panels. But they don't destroy elastometric flat roofs. Or concrete. <coughs> we have concrete tile in my neighborhood, and those stand up. They stand pretty up pretty darn well. Every now and again, you get one that gets knocked off, but they last stand yeah. But I think this hail thing, we, uh, it's new to me completely. But I think we, you know, that might uh, affect. But one other thing about the building height, uh, I think we can keep 35 feet, but to the bottom of the eave instead of to the middle. I've worked with codes that say 35 to the middle. It really affects your aesthetic because you tend to flatten the roof. So if you do it at the eave, which is actually the way they should be written. The original codes are written 35 to the eave. But I think you need to give every exception possible to anything that hides a rooftop air conditioning machinery. You know, so, so just anything that screens AC units on the roof should be exempted from the, from the height. I was thinking about that this morning, because if, if you guys are gonna have flat roofs, you still have the ACs on top, maybe, I don't know. Uh, and if, but if you do, they, you, should, you should be able to hide them without penalty. I also visited, uh, I don't know whether this is a liberal town or not. You know, it's, it's probably half-half, but there's, a, 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 there's not a great deal of consideration. I just want to alert you uh, for affordable housing, really affordable housing. You know, so we're not talking here about affordable housing. We're talking about people, housing for the young people, which are your kids. So our, 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 our program here is not dealing with the affordable housing, the national affordable housing problem. Somebody else, you know, is apparently going to deal with that. Well, Andres, I think, sorry, I think the diversity of housing that you're showing, the diversity of housing types kind of settles that for, right, that's what I was for our community. Yeah. 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 By having the compounds, as you call them, great concept. Oh, yes. Name, I think, has a negative connotation, right? But they're, you're proposing a lot of items that will help our aging folk as well as the younger. That's true. About the, I, haven't, I haven't presented the affordable, the compound yet. But that is, the model. we have families living like that in area where they buy multiple houses and then they have multiple families with different generations living in each house. So there's already a need for that. So that should be something we highlight tomorrow. I have drawings. I have drawings that I, uh, and we came up with something that I think is politically powerful. Let me just rehearse, okay? By the way, you know what you guys are, right? This is a rehearsal for <laughs> Tuesday night and you're a live audience. That's really how it works. Like I keep making proposals and how to, for example, I just picked up the compound has negative connotations as a, as a, as a term. So we need to, we need to call it something else if that's the case. But here's the deal to make it politically palatable. Okay, so let's take we let's say we take an eighth of an acre lot, which is approximately 54 by <coughs> okay, an eighth of an acre. And let us say that the average house that goes on at those guys next door, right there, is are 2,800 square feet. <coughs> You can either build, what we propose in the code, you can build one house at 2,800 square feet, one building at 2,800, two buildings at, um, it would be 1,400 square feet, or three buildings at, let's say, 900 square feet, you see? One, two, three. They're still under single ownership, okay? You can't resell them or anything. It's still a family, but it's a complex family, you know, with a caregiver living there or the son or the grandmother or the mother-in-law so you can actually assemble a society but it's one ownership and this is key one tap fee you know this uh, $80,000 fee that you have for each dwelling it really disadvantages the smaller houses because the big one pays the same amount as the little one 
So the idea is that the the whatever, let's call it $80,000 charge to connect to your existing infrastructure system, past and present and future, only applies, it applies per lot. So that I think that's a relatively easy proposal to actually create uh, create more complex living arrangements. Yeah, I, that one seemed to gather a lot of comments last night, positive comments. There were people that liked it because it works for those who work from home, uh, it works for parents with their young, younger children wanting to come back after college and still be in the community, <coughs> but not in the house. Uh, it works for couples with a nanny who need a place for the nanny. Right. It's caregivers. It's caregivers. Aging parents. A aging parents, and they need a caregiver. Yeah. So, it, yeah, that one was a really popular, was popular. concept. Yeah. With yeah. And it used to be very, very common. Like, if you go to the earlier settlements, if you go to the earliest settlements, let's say Virginia, if you go to Williamsburg, you will see that every single house <laughs> has dependencies. And if you go to the southwest, here, where we are, the Hispanic ones, the ranchos, also had dependencies. It was, it was really our original way to settle. Uh, now, Andre, along the same lines as you're talking about the um, cap fee versus a lot versus a house, it would be smart if uh, we could do the same with commercial. Because you're talking about the inexpensive commercial, no. and the difference in uses in commercial really is a different water use. Yes. And to be able to regulate that so you can get the good, expensive good commercial in. Uh, when we put the office, the leasing office in uh, at Vista Ridge, our cap fee was quite significant, even though almost nobody uses any water there. Um, and for what you're talking about for small incubator offices mm -hmm. with you know low water use versus, say, a restaurant, um, they should be different. Uh, and so you know, yeah, the town is, we've started looking at that in the last couple of months. Awesome. Because we've seen that coming up and yeah. we know it's just going to get worse over time. Yeah. So, you remember, great uh, idea, but, and we're working on it. Yeah, cool. The guy, the very nice fellow who gives you a massage so I can recover from the charrettes and you know, go back. He fixes me. He tried to move to a new place and he had to do the full tap fee and all he ever does is wash his hands. You know, between, between exactly. patients is ridiculous. Uh -huh. The same as a as a big house, so yeah, we got to do that. That's yeah. Here, five page code. Um, get rid of all the setback issues because you can't do that that auxiliary unit or that, yeah. uh, additional unit without violating. I mean, our, our lot sizes are set to the house size right now uh, within the setback. That's what drives the lot size. Okay, there's a. Let me be specific about that. Because the compounds, until you come up with a better name, okay? Because the compounds are compatible with single family houses, right? We, we, we intend to see them interspersed. It is, there's gonna be a place, of, all the compounds are over there, no. There's a, there's a, sorry for the term, there's a McMansion, okay? And then there's a compound next to it. We have to keep the same setbacks everywhere. You know, in that case, okay? But elsewhere, we may actually, uh, have different setbacks. And for example, your plan had all sorts of absurdities. The plan we inherited from these guys, and I actually thought, God, they're really hiring terrible people to do it. And it's, it was actually your rules. Didn't you guys give me a very long list? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, what happened is your code doesn't work for what we're trying to do. And so, um, although each item, if you consider it by itself, makes a lot of sense. It actually it screws up things. So that's a good thing to bring up. We're going to have something that you don't have now, which is called a regulating plan. And the regulating plan, okay, this thing here is called an illustrative master plan. It's just an illustration. It's to communicate to you, hey, this is really what we want. There's something called a regulating plan. The regulating plan has a whole series of small technologies. Like for example, it's got a frontage line. Okay, you'll see that there's a street, and then there's a darker line. That darker line tells you graphically where the front setback, where, where, where the building can go. You see? Because you can't code this. This can't be coded. We have to actually give you a line, a line, a line, a line, a line. If you want that plaza, there's no way I can write it up. It just has to have the frontage line. So the regulating plan forms an integral part of your code. 
And that's how all our stuff works, it's the regulating plant. And one of the reasons that our code is so small is that a lot of the information is on the regulating plant. <coughs> because right now, for example, if I want to have this, this green to happen here, and you give the developer a percentage of the green, believe me, you're not going to get that. So in our plan, we actually are going to draw something that looks exactly like that and say, you know, it's just it's graphically drawn. Now, the other thing that, it was, that, that we need to uh, speak about is I'm not sure that with every developer using a different engineer, it's going to be, it's going to coalesce in any kind of way. You know, you're going to get, everybody follows the same rules, but it doesn't, you know, the landscaping doesn't work right, a lot of things don't work right. I do think you need a coordinating engineer, as well as, a, as an architect, as a coordinating engineer that keeps, let me tell you a story, because some people only remember stories. Paris is a beautiful city, absolutely extraordinary. When Napoleon III took over in 1850, it was a series of villages, totally incoherent. And he had been in exile in London, and he saw Regent Street, and he said, Paris needs an image. Paris needs a, a brand. And he got Hausmann, who was the planner for 20 years, to write some codes that make Paris what it is. And there's several things. He says, you have to use the local stone, which was white. Okay, so Paris is unusually coherent in terms of its color. There's only two trees. In all of Paris, there are only two tree species. So all the boulevards, like if you look at a picture, if I put, if I put a picture up here, you'd say, oh, that's Paris. I know that's Paris. Not Munich, not anything else. And it's, it was the tree. It was the consistency. All the public works are coordinated. The benches are the benches. You know, the, the subway entrances are the subway entrances. And then last thing is he, he did several things uh, to harmonize the architecture, including in Paris, all the, you, there are balconies at 30 feet, continuous balconies at 30 feet. And that's kind of a brand. And if you go to other French cities, they don't have that balcony at 30 feet. But you don't know what they're doing, but Paris has a brand. Now, one of the things we do with our, with our codes is most of our most successful towns have an immediate recognition factor. Everybody knows what it is right away because of certain things that are controlled that way. So 15 years from now, somebody can take a photograph here and they'll, they'll know, ideally, they'll know that this is, that, that, that this is Erie Town Center. I think the regulating plan is a good idea. I'm not sure an outside consultant is needed unless the town doesn't feel that your own staff can do it. The engineers play nice together as long as we have unified street sections and everybody's on the same engineering datum. Right. It should be seamless as long as we have the Bible, which would be the, your plan and your, yeah. your code stuff, that staff can clearly interpret and give us yeah. Nope, yep, you know, you meet this, great, you know, I do, but I don't want to have to go through a third party engineer and get in line. I'd rather meet with town staff like we normally do, and as long as they have the rules right. and clearly understand it, it should be right. kind of business as usual in terms of getting. By the way, the, the, the regular. Do you agree plan. or does, but John Lee, you're shaking your head. I don't, I don't agree with you. Okay. I don't agree with you at all. I, I don't think staff so. I think a lot of the problems we have is because the town code. And the town engineers who are using all these other standards are doing exactly what Andre said the other night. Is it, that's where all the problems come from. No, but if we got a unified code for this area, that like if you got the PD, same street sections, and so we're forth. talking about a PD. Because I can say that even in Vista Ridge, the PD is different than the town UDC, and yeah. it was pretty straight up. Sometimes we had to tell staff, you know, "You're looking at the wrong book." Yeah, I think if there's a unified PD document with, with everything that it involves. I think it's all the problem. The town code is the problem. We've, we've got PDs that have town have road standards in, yeah. and they go, you can't use that one. Our standard is this. You can't use that one. Well, do you fight them for months yeah. and years? Or well, do you that's, go, yeah, that's the problem. We have to fight. I'll, I'll do what you want. Yeah. Okay, so we okay. have a longer okay. conversation. There's a very, very simple doc, uh, statement, which is about the third statement in our code. It says, oh, um, in the case of conflict with all other codes, 
and standards, the provisions of these codes and standards take precedence. You see what I'm saying? In the case of conflict. Now, we're not going to write about a bunch of things like where dumpsters go, etc. But, you know, we can't write a parallel code. But when there's conflict, this one takes precedence. And that's where it always works real well. Yeah, and I, I see probably six different road standards, seven different road standards that work there that shouldn't work everywhere else. Right. And may I say just another thing? Just one, one more thing about this. Uh, a lot of this stuff is actually we don't care about. Like when you look, you know, remember I just mentioned, I spoke about frontage lines, build two lines. We really only care about this and that. What you do in the back is yours. We actually, one of the things that causes your nightmare is that you're coded every which way from all four sides. Right? It's just ridiculous. When really, our job is just the public realm. It's where the, where, the, where the public is. And so we really, you know, we really do mean for you to do that. Now, in terms of the depth of your unit or what kind of thing you put in the back, etc., good luck. So actually, our codes free you up to... The, one of the mistakes of form-based codes that don't last very long is that it's with sort of maniacs that try to code all sides. We only code, we only code the public realm. And I think you'll find it really, really useful to, to not be constrained on all four sides. Yeah. Yeah. It takes the creativity out of everything. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I have to leave in 15 minutes for another town meeting. We haven't talked a lot about the Erie Commons parcel in some of our reviews. Um, and so I had a couple of questions that I know residents have been concerned about in the past that I would just like you to address. One, I can't remember if it was this area or another where you said the garages will be like under the unit. Um, parking has always been a concern. Um, for our residents around that site, if there's going to be enough on site or if they're going to leak into the neighborhood. And then I know your rear setbacks going to have to change because our, our code isn't set up for alley loaded products right now. Right. right. Um, well, we're, I think we're working exactly with your product, right? Yes. Which yes. is, uh, it's called, a, it's called, it's just the parking is tucked under okay. the back. Well, it's that grade though. It's just it's in so it's the it's garage, the is that grade? And, then, yeah. okay. and it's in the back. Do you have two cars per unit? It's like a detached yes. town. Okay. Okay. As long as they have two cars per unit. The issue is do we attach a garage or detach a garage? And it's, a, it's an impact fee. If you detach, if you attach a garage, it's about half the cost. If you detach a garage, because one's a single family detached standard, and the other is a multi-family standard. Okay, room okay. for improvement. We're, Malcolm, we're, write it yeah. down as we're going through yeah. our code. We're, we're, yeah. we're, we're going to clean that up. But, but let me ask you, you are, all your garages are attached. To the house. To the house, yeah. But not to the adjacent house. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, that's. I don't think yours is a problem. It, it's your your unit's not my favorite unit because they don't have a backyard and the first floor is small. But you know what the hell? Uh, they look nice. So where's parking for? So one of our the trustees always there. says, okay, so there's street or alley yeah. parking. Yeah, or? there's alley parking everywhere. And okay. Then, and then and then this, which used to be, there's a greenway yeah. to connect kind of nice, but then there's also, uh, I think you can get a lot more parking capacity. Parallel here. parking along there. Or even head in parking for okay. guests. Yeah. I just want to make sure we're addressing parking there because yeah. that will come up and I don't want that to be one of our things that drags your yeah. property down. The challenge is, is planning for Thanksgiving dinner. If everybody has a Thanksgiving dinner at the house. We can't we plan for, we can't, yeah. well, that's not how we should be planning our town. That's not entirely true because you just you should allow one thing to do is to allow people on certain holidays to park. you've got lots of parking here to just allow people to park there as part of your lease arrangement. Yeah. The code, yeah, the code yeah. does the code allow has to allow. Code, code letters won't count that. It yeah. only counts. You can't design. Look, if you designed a building, a hotel, for simultaneously all the toilets flushing at the same time, <laughs> right? Anymore. You know the pipe would be bigger than I don't know a room. So you don't do that. You cannot design the world either for Thanksgiving or for the drunk at midnight, you know, which is the other thing. You know, one of the really hideous things that I see here is somebody, every time there's a little, a little uh, slope change in the hotel I'm staying in, the, the architect actually tried really hard to make an interesting place, but everywhere that there's a slope change, there are handicap rails on both sides. It's, oh my God. I mean, it's, it's really pathetic. It's insulting to the poor handicapped. I actually don't need that, you know. I'm only going from here to there, and it's up 
eight inches, please, can we just not embarrass me with all these railings everywhere? So I think some kind of, by the way, that's exactly the slack that a city manager can actually say, you know what, yeah, we actually don't need rails here. It's just it's an eight-inch de deviation. That one may be a federal code. So. No, it's actually not. It's, a, it's, it's administered by lawsuit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's administered by lawsuit. It's actually, it's a very strange law. So what do people do in a city like San Diego? Let's talk about it, because obviously I've had to study how this is done. So San Diego has slopes everywhere, and it's got shops, and the lots are small and they're not accessible. So what they do in San Diego, there's a sign in the shops that say, we tried our best to accommodate uh, the disabled, according to the code. We couldn't do it, but uh, ring a bell and we'll come out and help you. Incredibly human solution, okay? Very rational, very human, very pleasant, and probably um, no one is going to come and try to sue you. Because remember, it's not by code. It's, it's you get an activist to come and say you're all screwed up. They will sue you for, uh, for all sorts of uh, egregious violations. But what I saw in the hotel was just little bits of, of deviation full of railings. It just destroyed the whole public space. I don't think we're going to have it here so much, but it's, it, but that's a kind of typical situation where where no one will give you a break. But you also need to hear about what San Diego does, because you know there are places built on slopes in this in this country that, that are not full of all this stuff. Great. Yep. So John brought up a point, and we talked about it yesterday with Paul. The town standard for collectors: there's two, plus there's an old one that's actually platted on our property for 60. There's a 70. There's an 80. Um, some of these roads are pretty big, and earlier conversations were bigger roads, faster speeds. Yeah. Right. And I think some of our roads are big. No. Well, it just it just looks like it on here. No, that's the right way. Road. Well, we already have drawn the inside. Yeah. I it's think you should have a look and see what right? you think. It's okay. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what there's you? parking on both sides of that main kilo, right? Typical 6034. Yeah. Yeah. 6034. This is Paul, Paul Crattery, who's the engineer who's been writing. We're writing a, a public works manual together. So that you need to replace the whole system and not just uh, tinker with it. We, you should probably adopt it once it's published. The, um, the collector that you're talking about uh, should have a, a bike lane on it because, because um, Jasper has bike lanes to the west. But it doesn't have to be anything like what Jasper is. Right, I just don't want a road that looks like you can land an airplane on no, 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 right. somebody gets we lost from the airport they come that's, in. I mean, they're huge, the, some of these roads, a lot of asphalt. dangerous by design because they're <laughs> very <laughs> But then we also found that actually some, uh, what did you find out about that subdivision? Yeah, I mean, that's what you get there. Uh, that, that we found on the way just out. Just to the west. Um, There's a subdivision to the west that has extraordinarily small streets. And the, the, the older standard, 30 feet from curb to curb. And, um, you know, it works. But I like your suggestion that if the PD document or whatever we call this prevails, so if there is a yes. conflict with public works, but this is what was adopted for this neighborhood. It has to. Otherwise, there's not as much incentive for you guys to buy into our. Well, just eliminates division. the argument and the delays. I mean, no, no, it, it actually right. screw up the design. It will actually okay. screw it up, and it's uh, so. But this is a very simple thing. This it leaves a lot of your existing code in place. Doesn't. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So, um, in terms of implementation, um, I'll park in the corner here. Um, the mechanics of like, is this a PUD, a zoning overlay? Is this a form based code? Like, in terms of implementing this vision that you've outlined the property, how does, it, how, how, does it, how does it lay out in terms of the mechanics? Are you also writing a land development code, zoning code? Because right now our project is zoned PD. To allow for mixed uses, so but is it going to be different in terms of what you're envisioning? Like, I guess it's kind of, we're trying to understand, like, okay, um, what it looks like. Is this a smart code? Is it can be? Is it an overlay? What is it? I've been, uh, had some interaction with Deborah about this, and uh, the proposal which she's considering now, I'm not sure, it's probably the easiest. You know, you have six, you have six districts already here in your code. There's, yeah. Right, Deborah. There's, there's. You have six districts. On these properties. No, uh, in your code, in your code. If you look oh, at. Are you talking the overlay ones? The overlay. Well, they're called districts. Okay. 
Okay, so we just added a seventh district. This would be one more district, and the district has its own <coughs> internal sets of rules, which we're going to try very, very hard to minimize. And so it'll be, it's just going to be a code that applies to this. And we replace the PD zoning? Yeah. Yeah. And it's more of a form based, which has height. Yes, but minimally. But it's not going to be one of these form-based codes that has all these little illustrations of buildings. It's just you'll see. I mean, you'll actually see it, and you'll say, "What a relief!" There's also we're also we're also there are areas in which things are very important, and then areas where it's not that important. So there'll be flexibility. You know, there'll be there, there will be a tendency to flexibility. I guess the height. Density, everything will be wrapped into a the density will be the height, yes, because the height, height is political. I've already touched that third rail. <laughs> okay, so oh, the height okay. is political, <laughs> uh, but the density is frankly what we're trying to do is uh, the, we're, we're counting. You know, we work with you on this stuff. We count the number of units, and this is this is would be ideal. But I don't think there's a there's a disadvantage if, for example. I just don't want to determine, you know, it really is ridiculous to determine now what's going to be selling five years from now. You know, so our code tends to have, it's good. there's a term which you should learn, it's called a parametric code. And what it is, instead of being precise, it gives you parameters. You know, for example, the front setback is between 8 and 16 feet. Instead of just 25, you know, it's between 8 and 16. Or, for example, the density here is, let us say we take this block, I'm not sure we're going to do this, but the density here might be between, or let's say the, I would never call, uh, let's call it density, although it would be more like lot sizes, this would be between 40 and 60 units. And what that does is, it's amazing how that relieves you from constant call for variances. Variances come up because things are written with one number. I mean, I'm sure you've had people come in and say, well, I'm sorry, that's a six-foot fence, and, and there's only a five-foot fence. You know, it's five feet, but you did a six-foot fence. Now let's have a council meeting on that. You know, like, <laughs> you know, so, but that happens all the time because of the false precision of people pretending that they know what's going to happen. So, Andre, so you're, you're saying that it wouldn't be, you know, these could be 40-foot lots here and 60, it's really more... How many metric, units in that little planning area? No, or, no, probably not that many units. Okay. Because, but it would be between lots between 40 and 60 feet okay. wide. Okay. Yeah. Lots between 40 and 60. Yeah. So then you don't have to come in when one lot is, you know, 38 feet wide. You know, it, there's all this stuff that actually doesn't matter, and we're pretty good at that. And by the way, if we oh, there's another thing too. There's a year-long period in which the code is used and we find loopholes, and then you, you call me and I fix it. You know, like the, the code is flexible also. <laughs> Uh-oh, they're abusing, they're abusing it. This is being abused. And then so do I come up, and this happens in all our projects. We, we have a, uh, it's, a, it's a beta, it's a beta code. And then we just adjust it to prevent things or to cause things to happen. Our tendency is to say, we don't want to inadvertently prevent anything that's really cool. Like if you come up with a really co cool idea that we didn't envision, you know, that's where you call me and say, no, that's cool, let him have it. <coughs> you know. uh, for instance, the, the road between the residential and the commercial there on the Erie Commons piece? Here? No, on the Erie Commons piece. To the right. Yeah. No, from over here. To the, um, the, the east. east. Go straight right. This way. Farther away. Keep going all the way. Right. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, it's you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this road. Yeah. Okay. It's a private road. We've always said it's a private road. But our PD didn't have standards for private roads. So instead of saying, well, what's the road really doing and how should it function? Does it need parking? What's it, how's it really working? It was, well, since it doesn't say that, you have to do a public standard. It's a private road. We don't want to ever maintain it, but you have to do a public standard. I think all that stuff, so our existing PD is over. Yeah, it's so over. now all of a sudden I got a 60 foot right away <laughs> through the center there. Yeah. So I, that's what, that's the implementation I'm worried about is how do we get to Everybody being reasonable sitting in the same room and just resolving. Yeah. Well, actually, I can see that we have, a, we actually have a kind of problem here uh, as designers because what we have done is we've, we've actually, we've been thinking 
of this as the A grid. So you can actually enter and go through and meet your meet the commercial and mixed use here and then throw the parking lots to the other side. Do you see do you see what I'm talking about? Yes. So this road is actually in in this plan at least it's envisioned to be like a nice place. Nice place. I'm thinking I'm thinking of uh, of places like for example there's a very there's a very snobbish town called Birmingham, Michigan, which they call the Greenwich of the Midwest for whom we did the plan. And there's a situation like this, and they're really cool restaurants and things. They don't want to open to the highway. They want to open to the, to the alley. It's, you know, of course, it's much cooler to be down there than the highway. So we were actually envisioning, and I haven't been working on this. I hope they've been working here. But the way that Senen has been envisioning this is that this is a really nice place, not, not an alley. But well, not that's six feet feet away. Away. Yeah. Is, is nice mean more roadway? Or does nice mean better sidewalks, more trees, more landscaping, you know, unique parts? We should talk about that. Let's, we just have to talk about it. Yeah. We have yeah. to talk about it. Once yeah. you decide, we, we decide together. I'm sure you have a vision, but we've actually seen other things that could be cooler, maybe. And then we just code it the way you, you want it. Uh, I think, I think, uh, one of, the, one of the things that has given alleys a bad name is that in places like Celebration, they're actually, they're built like full streets. You know, and so people say, developers say, I can't afford it. I can't afford to build the street in front and the street in back. Instead of, of knowing that the alley is actually built to driveway standards, you know, without the curbs and all that, it's built to driveway standards, then it, then it works. That'll be in the section. Okay. Yeah. Are, are you still working like on the drainage on our site? Still at the we're bottom? still. You're still working. I on gave them instructions. So we're okay. So there's that. I'm not sure they're listening. <laughs> and then there's the oil. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oil no, we, uh, I, we've absolutely removed this. I know. What we're trying to find out is where to put it. Right. But maybe you can help us. Yeah. The oil well circle yeah. is going to have an effect. The oil well Some circle problem. is. We have a memory of it. Where is it here? Or, right. About the, somewhere. Where that green park is, is circle. Yeah. Yeah. Now you can correct me, but but uh, somebody tells me that somebody told me that that well is not there for the long term. Fifteen years. What? Maybe so we should go ahead and design. Well, Leslie was going to find out from whoever holds yeah. the yeah. these Crestone. Crestones and check with them and see what the life remaining life is on that. But I mean, I, I agree with planning for it not being there. Yeah. But we still wanted to show it so we know. We'll show it. So we'll show right. it in the plan. We'll yeah. show you where it is. Yeah. I think you might have to come and actually help us understand where your where you want the drainage to go. Our engineer is going to be here. You know. Here's a, a general a general situation. So we've been speaking to the to the to the town administrator, mayor, etc., about passing this in principle in the December meeting and then going into the details. I think once you get your teeth into this, you you can understand, for example, this road, it's very interesting. I hadn't thought about it. Okay. I would just I wouldn't have done it this way, but Senen did. And that's what I mean, like, that's why we ha I have people that are, that are not me. And Sinin always got it through his head that this was going to be a really cool place. What I would have done is actually made it an alley. You know, make it an alley for this and an alley for that. I think Sinin has a very intriguing, had a very intriguing idea. If this doesn't work out, so I leave you the plan, I send the plan in, it gets passed in principle in December, but you can still come back and we can adjust it. That's what I mean by later coming back and adjusting things. Yeah. Well, I've well these we're, guys we're who, who you may not have a problem can go ahead and, and start. You know, while we're still talking. Yeah. We're, we're in agreement with you. It should, be, it should be a special place rather than a, yeah. a, just a back alley. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now we've pushed the buildings back to it. Um, so, so what's his thought on the... I'm talking about what on the front, the back of the building. Yeah, which is the front of the building versus the back of the building? Well, 
they, what I told him is that the buildings would generally open towards each other. Instead of, instead of, the, of, the, of, the, of the opening being on the parking lot, it would be on the side, so it could be accessible from both sides. That's what you're seeing here. These buildings open towards each other. You can still see the entrance. And then these buildings open towards each other mm -hmm. so that you know they can connect back. What it does is it's just a richer thing. I'm not sure anybody here has anything to do there. But if the, yeah. but you know, it's it just increases the possibility that they might. Sure. Well, if I ran it the other way, my idea, there wouldn't be any relationship at all. It's like two different spaceships. So I thought this was more, more interesting. By the way, one of the things you have to understand, what it feels like to be in a charrette. Like sometimes people give me ideas that make my teeth hurt. <laughs> and I go, oh, shit. And I'm thinking, shit, I'm saying, yeah, not really. You're not really going to do that. And then I said, no, oh, that's really good. And then it turns out to be good. So I always give a lot of slack to the, you know, the first half. Crazy ideas happen. And then, but towards the end, I really clamp down and say, no, it's not going to work. Probably I'm now working more at the level of, uh, of a smaller scale level of the aesthetic. Like it just occurred to me that just because Colorado doesn't have a, doesn't have a decisive architectural vernacular doesn't mean that this place shouldn't have a brand. You know, that looks a certain way that's recognizable that every, everybody wants. You know, so we can, we, we, we can work together. Because for example, you guys have, have uh, an architecture which I think is very up to date. You know what the, the new buildings you've shown me, mm -hmm. and maybe that has to be the architecture for everybody. You know, we say, well, this is what's happening now in architecture. It has to be for everybody. Let's let's all, since these guys came in first, let's have it look like that. Or vice versa, you can say, could we have a little more brick? You know, which is, uh, you know, which is everybody can work with brick. You know, so that's that's the discussion. I'm, I'm just going through my head. And I'm, uh, uh, and I'm doing this two ways. One is by looking at the latest, coolest places in Boulder. Like, what are they doing there? And the other one is just looking at your old buildings and, and, and just noticing certain things. Yeah. Having you know, some kind of blend. One of the things that we said when we first came out here, by the way, we came out here in 97, when we first started the property out here, and we said, there's no there there. And so that's why the monuments say Erie, Colorado, along Erie Parkway. Erie Parkway didn't exist when we came out there, out here. It, yeah. it was not even a dirt road. You couldn't get from one side of town to the other side without going all the way through town. Um, and we're still struggling to what is the there there? Yeah. What's the brand? And, and I think this is a huge step forward in creating the brand. What is Erie and what's there? Yeah. Do you know what the test is? Do you know how there are posters uh, for Italy and Germany and resorts? And the posters consist primarily of a picture, of a, sometimes an aerial photograph. And you say, oh, I know where that is and I want to go. No writing, no golf course, no bullshit. Just, oh, I want to be there. That's the ideal. It's a place that you can actually take a picture. Someday you'll take a picture of it, click. And they say, whoa, that's cool. You know, that, that's, that's, what we're, that's the ideal. We achieve it about half the time really fast, too. If you, if you Google Alice, A-L-Y-S, or Google uh, Hampstead in, um, in Birmingham, I'm sorry, Montgomery, or uh, about half the time we really hit it. And it becomes famous immediately, you know. By the way, one of the things you should do is, is uh, I, think, I think if you... You really should visit some of our communities. You won't take your family. It's it's extremely enjoyable, and you'll learn a lot. So, what would the feature be here that you would see that? What what what's grabbing you here that says that's the picture? Okay. If you're this morning, this morning, I I think you have a very narrow range of colors, which gives a lot of harmony to this. And, it, and you see it all over the countryside. There are browns and beiges and, you know, towards the reddish. So I would certainly keep the colors in that range, okay? Uh, how, do, how do you say that when uh, places like 
the Cinque Terre in Italy are known for their really bright colors. Because so that's, that's their, attractive. because that's what they do. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? That's their brand. I'm working mm -hmm. off the existing brand. For example, at Seaside, our first project, the code said you can use any color except beige and brown. <laughs> yeah. And it, it was an immediate brand, very photogenic, right? So, but what I'm saying is, well, that's what I would do here. I think, you, I think all this stuff fits into the landscape nicely. So I would, I would narrow the range. That's, you're asking me. But then you can get too narrow, like Santa Fe, everything's beige. Right. And I people know. get tired of it. But it's I, also instantly recognizable. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah, but if you live there, you get you know, it's boring. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you could also do, do something, you can do saturated <coughs> colors, which allow, for example, greens, as long as they're dark, you know, and not pastels, you know, which I think in Santa Fe, you, can, you get colors that are like brown, green, and brown, red, and so forth, but you can also coat saturated colors. That's one way to do it. Uh, another way is I think we should actually have either flat roofs or control the roof pitches to some harmonious, because you, what, what, what you get is you get this, you know, almost like a gothic pitch, and then you get a ranch house. You know, and that's really not, no great place it has roofs all over the place. They usually have a, that's why I want to liberate. I want to liberate the, 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 the pitch of the roof so you can actually get, get, you know, and just give a range, like between, let's say between six, let's say between five and 12 and eight and 12. You know, like that, and then it'll, it'll, it'll look except for porches that would be 3 and 12. Well, you mentioned Boulder. Everything new in Boulder is very contemporary. Flat yeah. roofs, a lot of glass. Right. We don't have any, I mean, Boulder doesn't, building this, maybe at the- But your stuff is, town. your stuff is very contemporary. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, and also at our meetings with the town, um, I think there was an interest in the, in the type of housing, but there was also um, a desire to have it look less like what we built out on Highway 7, something totally. a little more contemporary and, and more original, so that's why we changed all that architecture to, to they, what you they, see. Do you know what we're talking about here? They really did. <clears throat> so let's talk about that, okay? Because remember I said that we could, ha you know, we could have, it, have it look like the farmhouses, or we could have it look like your project, and have your project kind of you know, contaminate everything else with the modern. It is, if you look at Dwell Magazine, um, if you look at, you know, Architectural Digest used to be the standard of taste. And it was always traditional architecture. Now it's 50% traditional, 50% modern. But please notice that it's half the size of Dwell. <laughs> and Dwell didn't exist, you know, 15, 15 years ago. And it's like this in Architectural Digest. The younger people really want more glass. Okay, the younger people really want, they happen to like aluminum. You see this stuff? Is this aluminum? This is clear aluminum. It's clear aluminum. Yeah. Okay, you see clear aluminum? That was the worst of the worst. Ten years ago, nobody could stand it. It had to be anodized. Now it's the coolest of the coolest. Why? Because Apple made aluminum cool. Right? And I'm going to tell you the, the, the unforgettable anecdote that turned me around. A very cool young woman in a charrette. We were visiting the, the local houses and she said, we walked into the latest model McMansion and she says, if I see one more oak cabinet, I'm going to throw up into the sink. <laughs> you know I didn't make that up, okay? I'm gonna, she said, I'm going to puke into the sink. And I said, geez, whoa. And that's when I first noticed that things were changing. The other thing that happened was this very same woman, we were in a motel, and she was, she really got into a sliding glass door. She was doing like this and said, oh, this is really cool. And I, all my life I've always banned sliding glass doors. It was like the worst of the devil, sliding glass door. And she got into it, so I was alerted to that. And she was right, 15 years later. Now, if you look at Prospect, Prospect you know, our project Prospect, really nearby, is half traditional and half um, half modernist. So how did that go? First of all, it got on the cover of Dwell, which is really hard to do. Okay, usually it's just an interior or something. No, the whole project got under the cover of Dwell. But it is actually not very harmonious. 
prospect is not one of these things that you walk down the street and say, oh, I'm in heaven. No, it's like, whoa, you're looking at a lot of the architecture. But the reason that happened is that, is that in this area, even 15 years ago, there was a very strong market for modernism. If you haven't visited the prospect, you should. It's a, quite a complete project of ours, just in long, long. And that'll, that'll alert you to certain things. By the way, the other thing that'll alert you, there's some controversy whether the retail really works or it doesn't. I've heard both. I have to check it. I have seen it full. They tell me it's kind of empty now. But that's because we have one entrance. The DOT gave us one damn entrance. The whole thing is one cul-de-sac. How can you run retail with one cul-de-sac? And then they also asked us to reverse. The shops have to face in because the stacking lane, because they gave us one entrance, the stacking lane is this long. You know what I mean, right? So everything, everything's like that. So, you know, of course, the retail wasn't going to work. Although, the last time I was there was full of really great places. I don't know what's happened since, but we'll see. I have to check it. But I think the style thing, I would be very content if we could actually, and by the way, I think the retailers are going to do contemporary. If these guys are cool, they will do. They will want this stuff to be contemporary with lots of glass. Mm -hmm. but what's, yep. You, you said that since 10 years ago, it was way different. Yep. I, my guess is you're going to see a lot of commercial that extends 20 or 25 years to fill up that area. How does it change? You know, Seaside, um, yep. you know, some of these, Kentlands, that very strict, this is what you're doing. Yeah. Um, do we have that here? And, I think, I think the, cycles, the cycles are long. I think traditional architecture probably started in the 80s. I know, I know it did. It started in the 80s and started waning about 10 years ago. And, about, and then this thing is emerging very quickly. Every new building in Boulder that turns you on is modern. Yes, I agree. Period. Okay. So that's what's coming. And I'd be very happy if this were like that. I, the retailers I work with, like I work with Simon, you know, who, yeah. believe me, has the best consultants. It's all modern. They don't want to shop in things that look out of date. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, they're modern, but they're a soft modern. They, they bring in plants, they bring in oh, yeah. little architectural pieces or, yeah. or even statuettes. Or and other. they also bring a lot of natural materials. Right, so it's a warm, it, it's, yeah. it's clean, straight lines, yeah. but it's warm. It's the kind of warm the city that's got this the most figured out is Austin. Austin hit it, and what they did is they combined, their rule is this, okay? Their rule is actually pretty interesting, it's like no paint. No paint, so the aluminum is bare, the brick is bare, the stone is bare. And it's very authentic, paint covers things. Right? You can fake things with paint. So the rule in Austin is authentic materials. There are even places in Austin in which they actually, the sheetrock is not painted. It actually has the tape. You know, just before you, just before you paint, and you have the tape and the spackle and the nail holes. If you really look at that stuff before it's painted, it's actually a fantastic pattern. It's really nice. And then you paint it and you say, ooh, Sure, nice color, but I'm not going to remember it. And so what they do is they they paint the sheet, they do the sheetrock, and then they just put sander sealer on it so that it doesn't to seal it. And you're, you're you have this kind of construction site look that is really exciting. It's got a grid, you know, the tape grid and the spackle and the nail holes. Just look at look at a building. Oh, you've seen it, right? You've seen a building just before it's painted. It's actually pretty interesting. But I would say that we can actually write a code that says you use any material so long as it isn't painted, which will give you corrugated. You know, it brings the metal in, it brings stone, it brings brick, it brings certain kinds of wood in their natural state. And that is a, that is a, that communicates very well to the current generation. That, you know, the, current, the younger people don't want to be advertised to. You can't sort of, you know, they don't want to be bullshitted with ornament and, what are you trying to do? Convince me of what? They want the real thing. So, by the way, and uh, you see the, a jacket like this, or what I'm wearing. This, this isn't pretending to be anything but, but a really advanced material. And but it's really authentic. You know, they don't have to make it look like, like something else. And 
that, that's what they want. I think they want authenticity. Actually, I shouldn't be so hesitant. I know this. I'm, it's not even tentative anymore. I know that this is the way it is, that this is what the young people want. Now, if you ask me what the next thing is 25 years from now, I actually don't know what that is. But I do know what's, what's coming and what is already everywhere. Is red brick a brand that we should continue to use? Because that's a comment we get all the time. Put red brick on it. Make it red brick so it matches this building and that building and that building over there. We should kind of start down a path of a brand. Is it the one we want to stay with? Well, it's brown. Well, look out the window. I mean, yeah. It's kind of yeah, it's common. Look out the window. It's all brown. Brick. Okay, a couple of things about that brick. First of all, brick is in the repertoire because it is a thick material, it's not painted. But neat brick is not. Okay? This brick in which you actually, uh, how do you call it when you, sorry, uh, tumble it? No, not tumble it. But uh, when you take the, the grout and you indent it, so you know that? Point it. Point it. Point it. When you point it, okay? <coughs> The more, the more, uh, the detail that they like is they actually just scrape it flush or amazingly just smash it in so it actually breaks up the line. That's what they're doing. Because you see, that's neat. That's definitely not cool. It's okay, but not really cool. But it's what we've been using and yeah. it, we hear it all the time. Well, it's red brick on that because that's, that's the standard now. Yeah, but, but, uh, this is not the present. The present is, I think, well, this place is not exactly a vanguard. You know, um, you, yeah. eerie, it's when you're old. eerie, it's no, eerie period is that vanguard. But you got some very avant-garde places. Like you can just go to, you know, of course, Boulder and Denver are right cutting edge. And I think you need some of that. I don't want, can I just say something? I actually feel very strongly about this. I'm trying, I'm find myself being hesitant because I think you're pretty conservative architecturally, but really the future is not what you're building here. The future is what these guys are beginning to do, you know, which is, which is really much more modern, big glass corner windows. Yep. How do you see the transition from this traditional brick to a more modern, the architectural design happening in this plan? This is large enough that this is, just this place here is as large as your entire historic district. So it has its own internal, it, has, it, it can be its own separate self, it's large enough. If it were a project this big, just like that, you couldn't do it. It would look very odd. But within this, it's so large that you can make a place that's different. What about the Erie Commons piece? That Erie of, Commons. John's yeah. property. Well, that really abuts all this traditional brick stuff, so do I think, I think this stuff, because you're doing little cottages anyway, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. I think that actually this edge should probably be conser pretty conservative. Didn't you talk about having a bigger building at the end anyway? But that's what, yeah, that's what we talked about with, with Sanan is, is can we put the bigger units to the south, yeah. which is kind of contrary to what you would have thought. The reason they want the bigger units to the south is because they'll be higher priced and, and they're, yeah. they're so, similar to the homes. <laughs> see, the, the whole idea is that the street has to face like faces like yeah, on both sides. So this building should actually be bigger because of that and look more like it, aesthetically. Well, I guess the question was less about the residential and more about the commercial on... Oh, the commercial, uh, the commercial really is... The ideal right now is uh, corrugated metal and garage doors. That's what everybody does, even the highest end mm -hmm. retail. You have some of that in your downtown. Yeah. Yeah. The garage doors are wonderful because you opened up on good weather days. Yeah. So we shouldn't carry the red brick standard on the other side as a standard that you, you, you got to do. I think you have to be respectful of this street. No, I'm talking about commercial. Erie Parkway. Oh, here? It's, this, yeah, it's right across from this building. It's just on the near side of this building. No, so, I think, no, I actually have to frankly say, I think these buildings, the all the new buildings you're building here, the library is much better, but they're really out of it. Yeah. They're, they're just provincial. You're getting just, get your architects to wake up. 
they're, they're, it could have been built 20 years ago. The library is a much better quality building. That's much more. Yeah, much that, better. That bank, that bank building is about 17 years old. Yeah. This one is one of the most, is one of the worst. This one. Yeah, and it's a year and a half. Old. Right. Andreas, one of the things I like about Prospect and other communities, not necessarily yours, but Prospect in particular, it has a diversity of architectural styles, yeah. uh, both especially in the residential, yeah. but also in the commercial. Yeah. And I mean, I like that. Maybe some people don't like it. We should give a tour and stand in front of it and see what you like and not like. How did you? How was that? achieved or allowed or okay, okay. Uh, the method we use okay I think if you get architects to come in to do this every architect that comes in 90% of them would spend very little time on the planet just trying to do all the buildings themselves and then you'd get something that looked like a very big shopping center Okay, pretending to have variety. We learned early on that you can't fake diversity, architectural diversity. You have to get other people, you have to get several people to do the work. And so, after the first few projects in which we did all the architecture, and we realized that they were, it was just dull. We couldn't fake the variety. We, be, we kind of invented codes to invite, in many cases, dozens of other architects, some cases even hundreds, in the end, to do buildings. And so our projects are incredibly interesting because so many people have a say. When Kiki Wallace recommended us to give a list of architects, the first ones in were very stylistic. And you can see the first three buildings, one looks English, one looks French, and one looks German. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Near the barbecue place? Mm -hmm. And then we said, oh Jesus, this is really dorky. <coughs> this isn't gonna work. So then we got a really sophisticated New York architect to come down, who was a traditionalist, who was actually a traditional architect, but much higher quality. I forget his name now. Does anybody remember his name? He was, he was there. And then he was keeping up with the style. He was very conscious of the, he was very conscious of what was happening in the architectural world. And he introduced, um, he introduced uh, modernist style. He introduced. Now, that was dangerous for Kiki to do, right? Because the other stuff was selling. Why did Kiki do this? The plan for prospect is extremely irregular. Have you ever seen it? Okay. It actually, you enter and there are three avenues, each of which actually goes to a mountain peak. And then they wanted a jogging area, so then there's a circular there's a circular road that I think is a half mile. And the crossing of the three avenues, which are triangular and the circle, created an enormous number of irregular lots. A lot of irregular, if you look at it, you say, whoa, this is weird. And what happened is the traditional architecture, which is rectangular, traditional buildings are rectangular, couldn't respond to the irregular lots. And so, if you remember the architect's name, he started wiggling the buildings, and modernism wiggles better than traditionalism, right? It's just more agile. And so he gradually grew into a modernist aesthetic. Half the market wanted it, half the market didn't, okay? However, Prospect did not outperform the competition as thoroughly as most of our projects do. That's not a home run project. Like some of the others are just fantastic in terms of how much people will pay for it. And so my current thinking is that projects should be a little more harmonious, that actually enough people were bothered by it. As many people were bothered by it as liked it. And I think he would agree with that. But on the, on the other hand, but remember this was, we're talking about 50 to 20 years ago. I think now it's the modernist stuff is really prominent. Just look at, you know the Dwell magazine, you know that one's in the airports? Damn thing's half an inch. You know, it's really, it's really what's happening. Anyway, these guys, I'm sure very painfully, 
have changed their architecture for that reason, right? Because they used to do, you know, you've seen their older work and their current work. And I do think these people will come in, if they're keeping up with retail, they're going to come in with quite modern architecture. So. I do like the idea that materials should be authentic. Metal is metal, aluminum is aluminum, brick is brick, you know? And that would keep it, that would give you a kind of what, what they did in Austin that everybody loves. If you want to see what it looks like, there's two architects in Austin called Lake and Flato. Lake Flato, if you look up their stuff, it's very, very precisely what I'm talking about. And Austin is really proud of it. Lake Flato. There's several books on it. And did you say soft modernism? You, you were saying, oh, uh, I'm sorry, I have Bruce. Heard. Bruce, I don't learn anybody's name on purpose. <laughs> so then when somebody asked me who said that, I said, I don't know. <laughs> I learned Deborah. But, uh, the soft modernism isn't necessarily ornament. It's just kind of a more calm modernism. Yeah, just, it, it's yeah. taken from the mid-century modernism yeah. that's been updated now. Yeah. So yeah. it's big windows, it's, it's flatter yeah. surfaces, yeah. but it, it's colorful pieces of, of either plant life or... Well, pl you, can, you can miss with... with, uh, with you know, and you can add little... Like you add so I'll tell, you, I'll tell you another anecdote because Sorry about anecdotes, but you do remember them. Okay, so we were working in Miami to do something called the Design District, and it was going to be absolutely the coolest, most hippest place on earth. And all our consultants came in from Paris. There were all these guys in really slim suits that would come in and tell us what they wanted. And they said, well, we must minimize the architecture. And so we did very calm architecture. And they would come back a month later and said, no, 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 less architecture. And then. <laughs> We did less architecture, and finally they came back and said, no architecture. We don't want any architecture. And I said, why? Because it's always out of date. So what we want is glass, we want the inside of the shop to show, and then we want plants. Because plants never fall out of, never fall out of date. And those are the most sophisticated people on earth, telling us that no matter what you do, Architecture is going to be out of date, <laughs> so just an anecdote. But one of the buildings we redid in Cherry Creek was a brick building, and we just <coughs> wanted to disrupt the surface, so we had a six-story high piece of metal, mm -hmm. like railings, put on the side of the building. Trellises. A couple of places. Yeah. Uh, not for plants, just to offset, yeah. to give it a different... Well, uh, uh, trellises are, uh, don't commit you to very much. You put a trellis on top and it just casts a shadow and so forth. That's the kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that any kind of aggressive architectural <coughs> statement might be very cool, but it's going to be uncool in 10 years. That's, that's the fate of architecture. So I think that uh, a simple, if you could even, even your buildings, if you could just simplify them. What I would do if I were your, your uh, critic, the critic to your architect, I'd say, if you had to remove one color, one material, and one something of each, remove three things, what would they be? And then show me. You know, that's the kind of exercise I would say, can you, what would you remove? You know, it's like a really well, you know how they say that women should actually always remove one piece of jewelry? It's that kind of thing. You know, it's a, uh, architecture should always, these days should actually be less. Fewer corners. So it's just 11 o'clock where you need to wrap up this session.